DICE have just came out and talked about one of 2042's biggest issues, which is map design. We've got a blog post talking about how they see the issue, along with some questions for all of us. I'll get into all that in today's video, along with a bunch of leaks for some cool new weapons and vehicles. Anyways, let's get into it. So starting with the official stuff, there's the DICE blog post. They've clearly broken down the issues with map design into a few sections. Those being traversal, intensity, line of sight, paths, and cover. For each of those sections, they've asked us some questions, so we're going to go through all of those and talk about how I think they can improve all of these things. So starting out with traversal, they've acknowledged that it takes too long to get between flags and even mentioned that the game can feel like a walking simulator. That's something a lot of people have said, myself included. The fixes they've came up with are to reduce the distance between the base spawn and the home flags. Of course, this distance is only a small part of the problem, since the distances between everything else can also feel extremely long. Now within this section we got asked a few questions, like which maps provide a poor opening experience because of the location of the base spawn, and which maps are making it harder to get back into the fight in an all cap scenario. I think the first part is simple, all the maps have this issue but it only really gets bad in the all cap as they've already kind of discovered here. In that situation, the most obvious one for me is the Russian renewal team. The enemy doesn't have to all cap you even, they can simply just capture the building near your spawn and it cuts off reinforcements to see. It also has a similar effect to the tower near the Dawnbreaker spawn on China team, where players can sit on the roof of the building and shoot tanks and stuff as they roll out of base. It can be really really hard to get anything out of spawn, even if the enemy just captures that one flag, it doesn't even have to be an all cap situation there. This actually really reminds me of the Battlefield 4 rogue transmission situation as well, where the E flag had that building which was basically a TDM map and people just loved the deathmatch on that thing and holding it down as the Russian team again was next to impossible. It's kind of funny how they make the exact same mistake again but at the same time I do understand that fighting in both of those situations in that building is really really quite fun and for me that's like the lifting thing about renewal as a whole. That one building there is pretty much the most fun thing about it. Anyways moving on to that intensity issue DICE think that 128 player breakthrough can get too chaotic with too many vehicles, players and overall chaos, just making it really hard to figure out what's going on. They're looking into potentially changing breakthrough to 64 players only, or simply reducing the number of vehicles. They're asking how we feel about infantry and vehicle balance on breakthrough, and whether we prefer 64 player breakthrough. To me the issue definitely feels less prevalent on 64 player breakthrough, However, since the maps were actually designed for the 128 player game mode, it just doesn't really feel intense enough. A better way to attack this issue would be to address the root of the, the entire problem, which is the specialist and the vehicle balance. Start by restricting gadgets among the specialists, introducing forced vehicle selection, so you can't just choose a jet or a heli, you get one or the other and the map determines that, and then you gotta nerf some of these spammy garbage weapons on the vehicles which are just not fun to use and definitely not fun to die to. I'm looking at the Hydra Rockets on the Little Bird, every single 30mm cannon. Look, full stop, we don't need a 30mm cannon on everything in the game, and most of these transport vehicles are doing way more than just moving people around. Now Line of Sight is up next, and DICE have acknowledged that there's too much flat empty space on their maps. They also don't like how much long range engagement there is as a result of this. Apparently the majority of the issues are here from Kaleidoscope, but exist on other maps as well. This is definitely more of a breakthrough thing because I find it pretty good actually on the Conquest version of Kaleidoscope even playing as infantry. It's actually one of the better maps sometimes depending on how people play. Here they're asking which maps are the worst defenders for line of sight issues and to me it's a clear cut answer and that is Hourglass. At least on Conquest it feels easier to redeploy and pick a better spawn than running between flags. It's literally a desert and you constantly feel like you're going to get killed from everywhere running anywhere on that map. I'm not sure why DICE have been so obsessed with these desert maps, but they won't make an infantry only map. It really makes zero sense to me. Now pass is the next issue we've got brought up here, and to me it's a pretty quick one. It's referring to having a clear direction between objectives, and honestly this part might just be down to the incompetence of some players. They're saying that it can feel like fire is coming from all angles when defending, and it can make it too hard to hold the flag. They're also saying that it can be difficult to find the right path between objectives, and Honestly, this is just a non-issue. Like when I'm playing infantry on a flag and if I'm defending it, I'll simply look at what flags the enemy team has and I'll understand that this will be the general direction of the enemy. If I'm attacking, I'll play more based on minimap activity, sound, and the indicator on the flag that tells you how many are left on it. 
Once you wipe those enemies, you simply look in the direction of the spawn for the reinforcements, and then once you neutralize, you can assume there won't be any more spawners. It's really, really simple, and to me, that's just fundamental battlefield. And the whole pathing issue as well is just kind of... It's a bit of a laughable part, like... You, that's, that's part of playing the game, right? You have to figure out how to get between flags, and that's just Battlefield. I don't want it to be like some racing line that appears that shows you the optimal way to get between flags. It doesn't make sense, and it's totally situational, and I believe that's something that you just have to pick up as you play the game. Now, cover is the last issue, and it's pretty similar to Line of Sight. They want to introduce more cover for traveling between objectives and reduce that Hail Mary feeling of running in the open between flags. I think we mostly covered this when talking about line of sight, but an easy solution would be to add more quad bikes around the map. Doing this while reducing the amount of bolts and recon buggies would make the game a lot better in my opinion. And to me, there's plenty of cover on the flags, it's just traversing between them, which is a pain. And I think just adding something like quad bikes on pretty much every flag is going to be pretty harmless, and it'll be a good change overall. You also had things like, you know, towers, the, the radio towers that you can zip up. You can use them to parachute between flags, and I think that's a really good way of just kind of getting people around the map very quickly. And then besides that, I think they just have to add a little bit more cover on those maps that are the worst defenders, like Hourglass and Renewal. Just doing that in the areas between flags where you often do have a little bit of fighting could help a lot. Anyways, putting this stuff into practice, we actually have an example of the Kaleidoscope rework. Now on Breakthrough, they've done a really good thing here, and they've changed the path of the map to a more rectangular shape. This creates a much more logical path of battle across the entire map, and I almost think it feels like Conquest when you have the more square-shaped maps. Now in the Conquest version, the one I play a lot more of, they've done what I think will be some decent changes. Once again, they've narrowed the area of combat into a little bit more of a rectangular shape, and they've also moved the C objectives entirely. E1 and E2 are also now just one objective, which is definitely a good thing. Capturing E1, for example, is already very difficult due to how open it is, Combined with spawns coming in from E2, and it makes it really, really hard to push that flag sometimes. These changes look good, but we'll have to see how it feels in practice. Now, when it comes to actually getting these changes, they are scheduled to arrive during Season 1, and then the new maps that come out will also be designed with these things in mind. Now, talking about future maps, though, they've given us some takeaways and things they've learnt from the map design so far. Firstly, bigger is not necessarily better. Something the veterans of the franchise have been saying ever since we got told about these massive maps. They've also said that the future maps will be smaller than most of the current release maps as a result of this. Then they also talked about the idea of the rectangular play space, which is something that works really well, especially looking at maps like Zavod from BF4. With that though, we're pretty much going to wrap up the blog post. If you guys have any feedback, you can post it on the EA forums or Reddit as they're checking there. Now we're going to get into those juicy leaks. Once again, coming from Tempoil, we've got a new helicopter and a bunch of weapons. Now starting with the heli, we've got the RAH-68 Shoshone, which is DICE's take of the RAH-66 Comanche. Firstly, I'm really happy to see this thing in the game. As an Armor 3 player myself, I've had some great times flying and gunning these things. The league suggests that it's designed for speed, maneuverability, and devastating low-level casts. It's also able to fly at 180 knots, and it has a 20mm cannon and 1400 pounds of internal weapons. It's also got something called Air Launched Effects, or ALE, which integrates real-time target guidance. Sounds like a wire-guided system to me, and I really hope it's something like that, as that's what it had in Armour 3. Now for the weapons, we've got the AM-17, which looks to be some sort of carbine, the MGA Saw K, which is likely an M249 machine gun, and we've also got the TTS Exceed, which is a bolt-action sniper rifle. There's also the CRB Scout, which we don't really know much about, there's no pictures of that one, and aside from those primaries, we're also getting a few new pistols, the first one is the Sig Sauer M17, and then the next one is the M45A1, which looks to be a 1911 of sorts. Anyways, with all that said, I think we've covered everything. I hope you guys all enjoyed, and if you did, a like and sub would be appreciated. Take it easy, guys. Peace.